Oh, that was a great blessing. I'm telling you. Now, Miss Tina, most people don't know this, but she worked in the Christian school that I attended in Beckley. I won't tell them how long ago. Uh, but I've got some great stories on her. How many of you would like to hear some? Would you raise your hand? Look at that. Let's use that as a promotion for the evening meeting. We'll tell them tonight. No, she's got more stories on me, so I'm going to be careful. Uh, what a great blessing. I've never heard that song, but I loved every minute of it. Wonderful. Well, we're off to a great start. But we want the Lord to be thorough with us. Would you pray that right now? Just breathe a prayer to God. Lord, be thorough with me. Be thorough with me. We love to come to church and the preacher preach on everybody else's sin. Don't we all love that? You know when your pastor's really plowing deep and you cross your arms and say, I'm glad she's here today. She really needs this. <laughs> or I wish he heard that today. No, no. It's not my brother. Not my sister. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I need God to speak to me. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me. What book would you like to go to? That's great. Let's go to the book of Job then. Some of you that weren't in the Sunday school hour are saying, what on earth kind of preacher is this? He lets the people pick the text. <laughs> we're studying the book of Job, and we're going to stay here for a little while. We began in Job chapter 1, but I want you to find your place in Job chapter 19. And I bring you to an amazing portion of Scripture. And I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. Have your pen out. Because I want you to mark some things in your Bible and keep your Bible open because we're not, we're going to start here in Job 19 and we'll come back here, but we're going to look at some other verses all in the book of Job that will help us. And uh, I want to warn you that when I finish preaching, I intend to ask everyone here to respond. Everybody. So if you're breathing, I'm talking to you. And you say, well, preacher, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not into that. I don't respond, and I didn't come to respond today. Then you probably should leave. Really. Because watch this, please. If you hear the truth but won't obey it, then you're going to be accountable to God for everything you hear and refuse to apply. Now, how you respond, that's not between me and you. That's between you and God. But I'm going to ask you to respond because you can't be neutral on the truth. And look at Job 19, verse 23. And Job cries out. By the way, it's a cry. Verse 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. <laughs> and I want to pause just a moment and say, little did Job know that all these thousands of years later, not only were they going to be written in a book, we were going to be reading them. Yes. Look at this heart cry. His first word here, oh. You know what oh is? That's a heart word. That's a word that defies definition and defies description. It's what you say when you don't know what to say. It's the groan of the inner man. As a matter of fact, I was reading not long ago, and a man who was a, a firsthand witness of the great Welch revival. He traveled all over Wales during the age of the Welch revival that broke out. He said that one of the marks of revival coming to a church, and I thought this was very unique, he said one of the things, the precursors that he observed was that in every place where real revival came, it was preceded by this, the O returned to their prayers you ponder that just a moment he said he would go into churches and and they were stiff and they were formal and they were dry and they prayed beautiful eloquent prayers and they said all the right things but there was no life in it but he said then there were those churches where some dear old saint would stand and begin to weep and they said hardly anything but you could hear them cry out oh lord have mercy on us Oh, God, we need you. And our brother said, when the O returned to their prayers, the Lord was about to show up. There's an O in Job's prayer here. Notice his exclamation point. This is his heart cry. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. Now, wait, wait, wait. You've got to understand, Job's the oldest book in the Bible. 
Now, Genesis goes back farther, and actually, John goes back farther than Genesis. But the first book chronologically to be written was not Genesis. It was Job. This is an old book. Now, this is a man, excuse me for saying this, who almost lived in the Stone Age, who understood chiseling things in a rock because he knew if it was graven in a rock, it wouldn't be lost to time. Well, Job, I'm happy to report to you, you know it now better than I do, but I'm happy to report to you, God did more than you asked. He didn't put it in a rock, he wrote it in the heavens. See, because God's word is forever settled in heaven. Now, this is beautiful to me, but what was true in Job's day is true today. Now, wait a minute. Well, he lived on that end of history. We're living on this end of history. Let me tell you where we're living. We're living on the edge of eternity. That's where we're living. The next step may be into the presence of Almighty God. Any moment, Jesus Christ may come. But can I tell you what I've discovered? I've discovered that at this juncture in history, things that were written in the very beginning are taking on whole new meaning. Can I tell you why that is? Because truth endureth to every generation. And the same God that Job had to get a glimpse of is the very God we need to get a glimpse of before we see him face to face. And so we come to verse number 25. For I know, <laughs> I know that my Redeemer liveth. And, that's not all, that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. The message that I want to bring to you today, I'm not going to finish in this hour. It's too long, so you can just relax, all right? How many of you are glad I'm only preaching half a sermon today? Would you raise your hand? Shame on you. Matter of fact, I'm going to finish it in the evening hour, and so I want to encourage you. Read the book of Job. Pray. Come back tonight because we're going to pick up right where we leave off this morning. It's really a message that encompasses the whole book, so we're going to look just at the first half of it, look at the second half tonight. What is the message that's encapsulated in these verses? It is this. Would you write this down somewhere, maybe in the margin of your Bible, next to these verses? I'm speaking on Job's cry and Jesus coming. You see, this book, pardon me, is not just about Job. It bears his name. It tells his story. I mean, we learn a lot biographically about Job and his wife and his kids and his troubles and all of that. But really, no book of the Bible is about man. Every book of the Bible is about the God-man. As a matter of fact, pick a spot, any spot, Jesus is there. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's a Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our great high priest. In Numbers, he's that pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the lawgiver. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is the righteous judge. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, Kings and Chronicles, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. In Ezra, he's the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the builder up of the broken down walls. In Esther, he's the God who's present when his name is not. And in Job, Lord, are you in Job? Oh, yes, Jesus is all through Job. See, the beautiful thing is that the oldest book of the Bible reveals the actual heart cry of every man from the beginning of time. He's called the desire of all nations. May I make it more personal for you today? He's not just what nations are looking for. He is what every man is looking for. There is a God-shaped vacuum in every heart that only Jesus Christ can fill. And I don't know you. I'm sorry. I don't know you. I want to get to know you this week, but I, I don't know the people in this room, and I certainly don't know the deepest needs of your life, but I know this, and I believe that I know it of a certainty because I've seen it in Job's life. I know it because I've seen it in my life. It is this. Whatever your need, Jesus meets that need. Amen. And Job's cry was met, praise God, with Jesus coming. 
It's beautiful to see all the questions that are suggested in this book that are only answered in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, people look at the book of Job and they say, oh, I know Job. That's kind of a depressing book. Not if you're looking at it through God's eyes, it's not. It's not depressing at all. It doesn't bring us low. It lifts God high. That's two different things. Look, Job is not a book about suffering. It's a book about the Savior. Are you ready for this? Let me tell you what Job teaches us. Job teaches us that it doesn't matter what your difficulty, what your struggle, what your strain, what your stress. Look, you bring every complexity in life into the simplicity of Jesus Christ. We live in a weird world. A mixed up world. How many of you have watched the news in the last 24 hours? Would you raise your hand? It's depressing. And some of you, your family situation is all turned upside down and your business seems to be spiraling out of control and your emotions are running wild with you and your mind's going 100 miles an hour and you laid in bed last night, couldn't even rest because your mind was racing. You know what you have? You have complexity that can only be met by the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. The questions may be complex, but the answer is simple. Job's cry is met with Jesus coming. You see, behind Job's complaint about his physical problems and, and his emotional needs and his financial woes, behind all of that complaint was a much deeper cry. What was he crying out for? Look, he was crying out for the Redeemer to show up and to do something in his life. You know what Job is? Job's a book of poetry. As a matter of fact, look at my Bible just a minute. I don't know. If your Bible looks like this or not, you may have lots of study helps in the back that makes it different than this, but would you look at it? Where is Job? It's right where? It's right in the heart of the Bible. You know why it's right in the heart of the Bible? Because it's one of the heart books. You know what the heart books do? They get straight to the heart needs of man. And I want to say to every man, every woman, and every young person that's looking at me and listening to me right now, I don't know your need, but I know this. When Jesus comes and makes his presence real in your life, that will meet every need you have and then some. Amen. So with that in mind, let's, let's journey through Job. We're coming back. We're coming back to chapter 19. Be patient with me. Go back with me to chapter 9 just a moment, would you please? Here's Job's first cry. Look at Job chapter 9, verse number 1. Uh, then Job answered and said, I, I know it is so of a truth. Speaking of his own sinfulness, of his own wickedness. By the way, if you want God to step into your situation, you've got to first agree with God. Yes, I've underlined in my Bible the word truth. You remember that? You remember that woman, that Syrophoenician woman that came to Jesus and Jesus said, it's not right uh, to give the children's bread to dogs. You know what she said? Truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. Some of you are trying to convince God about something. Look, you're not going to win that argument. Let me tell you what you need to do today. You need to get down on your knees and say, truth, Lord. Stop trying to clean yourself up and agree with what God says about your sinfulness. Stop, stop trying to figure out what's the next step to take and agree with God about your ignorance. Stop trying to make yourself stronger and agree with God about your weakness. Truth, Lord, all of that is the truth. Look at the rest of the verse, but... How should man be just with God? Would you write this down? Job's first cry that was met by Jesus coming is this. Job cried out to be justified. He knew that he was guilty. He was under the condemnation and weight of his own sin. And by the way, the devil loves to keep man under that guilt and condemnation. Aren't you glad that there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit? Some of you are weighted down today. I want you to know, how can a man be just with God, Job? I'm glad you asked the question. The answer is Jesus. Matter of fact, would you do this? Take your pen, and at the end of the question in verse number two, just write Jesus' name, would you please? You're not adding to the Word of God. That's actually what the Word of God teaches. Romans chapter 3, we love to quote verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But read the rest of it. Let me just read it to you. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 24, says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And listen to verse 26. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be, are you ready for this? Just and the justifier of them that believe on Jesus. Can I tell you who Jesus is? He is the just one and he is the justifier. He is the only upright, sinless man that ever walked this planet and is the only one that can take sinful men and sinful women and sinful young people and make them justified before a holy God. 
Job is full of talk. We'll talk about that more later this week. There's lots of words in this book, but can I tell you that when you finally get right with God, you stop doing the talking. Look at verse number three of Job chapter nine. If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. You know what he's saying? I'm speechless in the presence of a holy God. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 143, verse 2, In thy sight shall no man living be justified. In other words, it doesn't matter what you say. You cannot justify yourself. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse number 20 says, The Lord, are you ready? The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. I got to tell you, preacher, I love amens. I love hallelujahs. I love praise God. I, I like all of that. I like people saying preach. I, that's good. That's very good. Some of the meetings where I have been, where we have sensed most the moving of the Lord, one of the things that seems to enter into the place is silence. I can't explain that to you. Other than to say when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, he got real quiet and said, oh, woe is me, for I am undone. And when Simon Peter saw the Lord as he was, he said, Lord, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. And when John saw him in his glory, he laid down and played like a dead man. And I'm going to tell you why. Because holy God cuts through all the noise. And when the Lord's in his holy temple, you just got to be still for a moment and know he is God. As a matter of fact, for all the talk in the book of Job, when you finally come to Job chapter 40, I love this. Job looks at God and says, I'm going to lay my hand on my mouth. We're pretty good at talking about our goodness, defending ourselves or excusing our sin or explaining why we did the thing that we did. But every now and then, excuse me, it might be good for us just to lay our hand on our mouth Stop doing all the talking. By the way, do you remember what one of the names for Jesus is? He is the Word. Yeah. Let me tell you what happens. When you stop doing all the talking, Jesus speaks up. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When Christ speaks for you, you're justified. The moment you stop trying to defend yourself and you let an attorney with nail-pierced hands stand up and hold up one of those hands, friend, it's all cared for. Because now suddenly Christ is speaking for you instead of you trying to speak for yourself. Look at verse number 14. How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? He says, I, I want to reason, but I don't, don't, I don't know how to reason with God. And Jesus says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But wait a minute, that only happens when Jesus steps in. Preacher, I was thinking about this this week. When I was in Bible college, we had an old fellow named Frank Sells that would come teach the Bible to us. I love Dr. Sells. I'd give anything. I'd pay $1,000 to sit in the room and listen to him talk one more afternoon. And I mean that. When he opened his mouth, the Word of God just came out. It was rich. He looked like Harry Ironside, totally bald. He couldn't stand. He'd sit behind a desk on a platform, and he'd rub his bald head and teach the Bible. Man, I love that guy. He had a way of leading you into truth until finally it just smacked you in the face. And one day, he was talking about the high priest on the Day of Atonement. And he said, he described the high priest's garments and, and what he did and how he went about his service and the procession and, and how he went into the holy place on the Day of Atonement to make atonement. And then he said this in his quiet, mild-mannered kind of way. He said, now let me ask you, students, when the high priest got in there on the Day of Atonement, what did he say? And we all sat there looking at one another. And some of the real scholars opened their Bible and started flipping through, you know, trying to find it. Everybody's whispering to one another, what did he say? What, what did he say? And Dr. Sells just sat there rubbing his head, smiling, looking at everybody. What did he say, class? And then Dr. Sells said these words. He said, he said nothing. The blood spoke. I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't need your words today. You need Jesus to speak for you. 
You know what your cry is? Oh, God, how can I be justified with you? And Jesus said, I'll take care of that for you. Look at verse number 15. Whom though I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make my supplication to my judge. There's nothing I can say. Look at verse 20. If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I'm perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. You can't justify yourself. Only Jesus can do that. Let me show you the second cry of Job answered with the coming of Jesus, same chapter. Look at Job chapter 9, verse 30. If I wash myself with snow water, make my hands never so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. Let me stop just a minute. There's something in all of us that wants to be clean. You want to be clean? By the way, isn't it wonderful when you finally get clean with God? But how do you get there? He said, if I wash myself, friend, you can't wash yourself. As a matter of fact, in chapter 25 of the book of Job, one of Job's three buddies, one of his counselors and friends, tries to explain to him about being clean with God. Let me tell you something. Not only can you not make yourself clean with God, nobody else can make you clean with God. Only Jesus can do that. Significant to me what he says at the end of verse 31, my own clothes shall upon me. Immediately my mind went to Isaiah 64, 5. All of our righteousness is, are as what, church? Filthy rags, literally leprous rags. He said, my own clothes stink, my, my own leprous rags, oozing with the pus of my own iniquity and transgression and sin, cries out against me and says, unclean, unclean. Only Jesus can make a man clean. But read on. It's more than just clean. Look at verse 32, for he's not a man as I am. That I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us, oh, I love this, that might lay his hand upon us both. Would you write down Job's cry is not only to be justified, Job's cry is for a mediator. The word daysman here literally means a mediator, a, a go-between, an advocate. I'm thinking now, 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Oh, wait, wait. What does it say? The what? The man, Christ Jesus. Look at verse 32. What was Job's cry? He is not a what? Excuse me. Verse 32 says he is not a what? A man. He says he's not a man. If he were a man, then I could talk to him and he could talk to me. So God said, I'm going to become a man. And God took on human flesh and stepped into human history. Why? Because only then could he be our mediator. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He's not just a man, friends. He's the man. He's the God man. And as the man, he is our mediator. First John chapter 2. And if any man sin, let me just pause. Let's take a survey. Has any man in here ever sinned? Would you raise your hand if you've ever sinned in your whole life? If any man sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You know what that is? That's God's answer to Job's cry. Look at verse number 33. He says in verse 32, I, I wish there was a way we could come together, come together, come together. Oh, but your sins and iniquities have separated between you and your God. Look at verse 33. That's why you need a daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both can I tell you what happened on that cross? Look at that cross or that cross. Jesus Christ took a holy God in one hand and unholy fallen humanity in the other and made a way so that we could come together again. The, Job, the cry of Job was to be justified. It was to be mediated, and Jesus said, I'll do all of that. Now that's not all. Come over with me, please, to chapter number 14. Here's the third cry of Job. Job 14, verse 1, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. By the way, I hear lots of people quoting that verse that never read the rest of the chapter. And let me just tell you, I'm sick and tired of hearing the bad news without the good news. As an evangelist, everywhere I go, everybody's favorite verse now is, well, you know, preacher, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Now, that's in the Bible. But when God said they would wax worse and worse, he never said his power would wax less and less. So pray tell me why God's children who ought to be filled with hope are living like an entire world that needs hope. Why are we wringing our hands like the rest of the world talking about the trouble and how bad it is when we have the God of all hope living inside of us? Read on. 
He repeats in verse 4, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one. Isn't that interesting? Over and over, want to be clean, want to be clean. Look at verse number 7. For there is what, church? Circle that word in your Bible. It's used 133 times in the Word of God, hope. There's hope of a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again, that the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stalk thereof die in the ground. Yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? Let me answer that question from Jesus. When you die, you are either in eternal life or under eternal condemnation. That's where man is when he dies. But it's significant here that Job's hope was all earthly. Even the illustration he uses is a tree. It's, it's a physical thing. But wait a minute. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in the world to come. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the New Testament that our hope is laid up for me in heaven. Look, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Paul even wrote, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most what? Miserable. And I got to tell you, we live in a miserable world, but God's children ought not be miserable. We ought to be the happiest people on planet earth because our hope is in Jesus Christ. Some of us need to get our heads up this week and lift up our eyes and fix them on Jesus again and remember there is hope in a hopeless world. And the cry of Job is for hope. Look at verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? And I've written in the margin of my Bible, yes. How do you know it? Well, let's come back to chapter 19 where we started, coming full circle now. Because the words we began the day with are actually words of great hope. And before we read them again, would you look me in the eye just a minute? You're living in the most drugged generation in the history of the world. Everybody wants to talk about illegal drugs, and I'm against them. But I'm telling you something, we live in a world filled with lots of prescription drugs because everybody's trying to numb the pain. Do you know suicide is up 300% in my generation from my dad's generation? 300%. And do you know why? People have lost hope. So you want to give them hope? How do you give them hope? Give them Jesus. Where's the hope come from? Look at verse 25. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Hope is found in the fact that we have a God who's very much alive. I know he's alive. And not just present tense, look at the future. He shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. Aren't you glad this is not the end of the story? There's more to come. By the way, if you're a child of God, the best is always yet to come. And that's not all. Now it gets personal. Look at verse number 26, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Watch this. Not only is God alive, I'm going to be alive. Watch. And not only is God going to stand on the earth, I'm going to see him. Some of you are so dismayed by what you've seen lately. You need to get your eyes off of all of those things and get your eyes back on Jesus by faith today. Some of you, I'm talking about Christian people, Job's losing hope trying to figure out where God is. Friend, God is where he's always been. God's seated on the throne of heaven. He's got his eye on you. He's got every hair on your head numbered. He knows you by name. He remembers that you're dust, and he still has everything under control. You can trust him. What is the cry of Job? It is to be justified. It is for a mediator. It is for hope, but don't miss this one. Look at chapter 16. We'll end with this one. He cried out for a friend. Everybody needs a friend. Everybody needs a friend. By the way, sometimes the people you think are your friends don't turn out to be such good friends. You don't believe me? Ask Job. He had three of them. Look at verse 1. Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Now watch this. Miserable comforters are ye all. I've marked in my Bible, miserable comforters. How many of you ever had a miserable comforter? Uh, let me just tell you, this world is full of them. The Eliphazes and the Bildads and the Zophars that got all the answers but have no answers. You know the difference? Look at verse number three. Shall vain words have an end? Let me tell you the difference between the miserable comforters and the true comforter. You ready for this? The miserable comforters are full of words, but the true comforter is full of love. You know why Jesus came? He came to be a friend of sinners. If you don't believe me, ask all the publicans and sinners he ate supper with. 
If you don't believe me, ask Zacchaeus. If you don't believe me, ask those lepers that he touched. If you don't believe me, ask that adulterous woman that he said, go and sin no more to. Friend, he is a friend of publicans and sinners. Come down, would you please, to verse number 10. It's prophetic of Christ. They have gaped upon me with their mouth. They've smitten me upon the cheek reproachfully. They've gathered themselves together against me. Some of you feel so forsaken. Let me remind you, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Some of you are so disillusioned and disappointed because some man did you wrong or some woman let you down. Let me remind you, only Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But don't miss this. This is not just about Job. This is about Jesus. Look, please, who's going to be smitten upon the cheek? Jesus is. You know what this is? This is a picture of the Christ who is forsaken of every one of his friends so that he could befriend every sinner. I just want to pause right now and say thank you, Jesus. You think you've been forsaken and failed and forgotten? Not like he was. He was forsaken on that cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you know why he was forsaken? So he could be your friend and you would never be forsaken. Come to the end of the chapter, look at verse 21. Oh, there's that oh again. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleadeth for his neighbor. Now, I want you to circle the word neighbor there in verse 21 and write in the margin of your Bible. It's the same word that is used for friend. Can I tell you what Jesus is? He's the nearest neighbor you're ever going to have. He's the best friend you're ever going to have. Matter of fact, John chapter 1 says that the word became flesh and, wait for it, dwelt among us. It literally means he pitched his tent next door to ours. Do you know what Jesus did when he came to this world? He became your neighbor so that he could bring you into God's house someday. And some of you are low and discouraged today. I want to remind you what a friend we have in Jesus. Take your hymn book out, would you please? Would you find your hymn book? It's there near you. I'm not going to sing. Relax. I want to show you two songs. Find hymn number 89 just for a moment, would you please? I like the way every verse starts of... This hymn, first word is Jesus, all five verses. If you look at the bottom, you see the name J. Wilbur Chapman. You know who J. Wilbur Chapman was? J. Wilbur Chapman, somebody says, oh, J. Wilbur Chapman, he was one of the great evangelists of all times. That's true. Somebody said, J. Wilbur Chapman went around the world and preached the gospel and brought thousands to Christ. That's true. <laughs> Let me tell you about J. Wilbur Chapman. J. Wilbur Chapman had two wives die. In the space of 21 years, he lost his first wife and his second wife to death. In that same period of time, his infant son died. J. Wilbur Chapman, a man mightily used of God to help hurting people, had his own wounds. You think you're the only one? One day, J. Wilbur Chapman sat down and wrote these words. I just love them. I want you to look at them. Look at that first verse. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me whole. And I love the chorus. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Look to Jesus, sir. Look to Jesus, ma'am. See, I have no new message for you this week. I have no clever thing to say to you, but that's not what you need anyhow. You need Jesus. You need to fall in love with Jesus all over again. And while you have your hymn book out, turn over a few more pages, would you please? Come to hymn number 435. I like this one. I like them all. When you get to hymn 435, you'll see a name at the bottom. The name is Joseph Scriven. Not nearly as well known as J. Wilbur Chapman. Joseph Scriven was a young man living in Europe, engaged to be married, so excited, bright future, talented, gifted young man. And the night before his wedding, his fiance drowned and his world fell apart. Life seemed to be spiraling out of control, so he packed his few belongings up and moved to Canada just to get away from it all and start over again. Oh, his heart was crying out for something. Maybe a change of geography would fix it. Maybe, maybe new friends would fix it. Maybe something would meet the emptiness within. He got to Canada, and in a matter of 
couple years, he met a beautiful young lady, and he decided she's the one for me, so he gets engaged again. And days, days before that wedding ceremony, his fiance tragically died. Life is coming apart at the seams now, and Scriven thinks, I have nothing to live for. And at that very moment, a letter comes in the mail from his mother overseas, and she said, son, I'm dying. I won't live to see you again. So now his, both of his fiancés are dead, and now his mother, who loved most on earth, is dying, and it's just like everything's gone. Everything is, is, is disappearing. There's no hope. And Joseph Scriven would later testify that in the midst of all of that darkness, God graciously showed him light. That in the midst of that emptiness, God brought the fullness of his presence. And Joseph Scriven sat down one afternoon with a pen and piece of paper and wrote these words. Would you look at them? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, oh. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, encumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. And I just want to pause and say, what a friend we have in Jesus. My brother, my sister, the cry of your heart can only be met by Jesus Christ. Only Jesus, only Jesus can take a cry and turn it into a chorus. <laughs> only Jesus can take a groan and bring glory. Only Jesus can bring a sigh to a song. Only Jesus can change all of that. Get your eyes off yourself. Get your eyes off your trouble. Get your eyes off your sin. Get your eyes off your friends. Get your eyes off your enemies. Get your eyes off this world. And get your eyes on Jesus Christ. He comes. And when he comes, friend, he meets the deepest cry of your soul. Our Father, we just want to thank you for Jesus today. And I pray, O oh Lord, at this moment that you will move and work in this meeting and in the hearts of people all over this building and those who are listening and watching. May the Spirit of the living God lift up Jesus. And as he's lifted up, may you draw them to yourself. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We sit quietly for a moment. How many of you know you're saved and you're certain of it and you're glad about it? Would you raise your hand? Would you keep your hand raised? With your hand lifted to heaven, I want you just to thank the Lord right now. Before we do anything else, just thank Him. What a Savior. What a friend we have in Jesus. Bless His holy name. The Bible says we lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Oh, I hope God's love has conquered the wrath in your heart. And I hope God's assurance has conquered the doubting of your soul. And you can say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know it. I know I'll see him someday. What a Savior we have. You may lower your hands. Maybe you're here today and you couldn't raise your hand with confidence. You're not sure. I want to give you an encouraging word. You can be before you leave here. You can leave saying, I know. I'm not going to embarrass you. You don't know me, but I'm, I'm not trying to trick you. I want to pray for you. Who among us today would say, Preacher, I couldn't raise my hand with confidence. I'm not sure that I'm really saved and my sins are forgiven and my guilt is gone. I'm not sure that I'm ready to meet God if He came today. I'm not sure that I'm ready to go to heaven, but I'm sure of this. I don't want to go to hell. Preacher, pray for me. I need to get my salvation settled. You're talking to me. I want you to raise your hand high in the air with mine just for a moment long enough for me to see it and pull it back down say pray for me I'm not sure I'm saved raise it big and high pray for me I don't know the Lord but I want to know him I need Jesus pray for me anyone like that at all I'm looking anyone 
then best I can tell, I'm speaking to God's children. And before I do, let me just say, if you happen to be in here at this moment and you're not a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, and you're not sure, I'd run to Jesus. I'd get out of my seat. I'd come to the front. I'd find one of these men holding a Bible. And I'd say, show me how I can know for sure that I'm ready to meet God. Come to Jesus, my friend. By and large, this place is filled with believers, and I'm happy you know the Lord. So I want to ask two questions of God's people today. Here's the first. Many of you are in the Bible study early. God's speaking to you. How many Christian people in this room would say, Preacher, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. But the truth is, I'm not where I need to be with my Redeemer. There's something in my heart God's already convicting me about, dealing with me about, speaking to me about. God's got my attention, preacher. There's some things I need to get right with God as a Christian. Pray for me. I want you to raise your hand big and high in the air with mine right now. I see you. If you mean it, I want you to stand up right where you are. Just stand up right where you are. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Who else? God bless you, ma'am. And you. Thank you. Who else? God bless you. Who else? You say, I'm a Christian. There's some things I need to get right. If you're standing, would you look at me? I want you to know this is the beginning of revival when people, God's people, get thoroughly right with God. Now, I'm about to ask everybody else to respond, but I'm going to ask you to lead the charge. If you're physically able, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat right now. Come kneel on this altar. Tell God what you just told me. Would you come on right now? And by the way, be specific with Him. You don't have to be specific with me, but be specific with Him. If you need to speak to a pastor, there are pastors here along the front. They'd love to talk to you. Shake one of their hands and say, pray with me. I need some help. Nobody's going to embarrass you, make a spectacle out of you. We want to encourage you. You're coming as a Christian to get right with God. And maybe you're coming today to be baptized like this young man. Or you want to join this church, put your life and influence here as a member. Why don't you get up and come now? Before anybody else moves so you don't get lost in the crowd. If you need to be baptized or join the church, you come now. Let us help you. And I want all of God's children seated in this auditorium to lift your head and look at me right now. I said I was going to ask everybody to respond, and I am. I believe something, preacher. I believe revival is really one thing. It's when God's people fall in love with Jesus all over again. I'm talking to some people here today who have been saved a long time. Some of you know a lot of Bible. You can quote portions of Job. But I wonder how long it's been since you said, Jesus, I love you. I deserve to be in hell, but I'm not there and I'm never going there. I just want to thank you. And I want to be close to you, as close as I've ever been now. That is the essence of revival. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to begin a prayer. When I finish my part of the prayer, I'm not going to say amen because I'm just starting it. I'm not ending it. When I finish my part of the prayer, I'm going to ask every one of you who are physically able, if you're not, stay right where you are and pray. But every one of you, God's children that are physically able, I'm going to ask you to find a place on your knees. You can come, kneel on this altar, and down the aisle, at your seat. But I'm going to ask you to get on your knees. You look at me just a minute. You know what happened in Job? God brought him low. God brought him down. God brought him to his knees. God brought him to the end of himself. Listen to me. That's where the new beginning happens. And I'm going to ask you if you're physically able to get on your knees with me this morning. In the first meeting, we're going to begin this revival meeting in prayer. Asking God to help us get a fresh glimpse of God and fall in love with Jesus all over again. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, would you do thy deep work in us? Would you change us forever? Give us a glimpse of our Redeemer such as we've never known. Help us to love you as we never have before. For Christ's sake. And right now, quickly and quietly, all over this building, if you can find a place on your knees, I'm going to ask you to do it. Would you do it quickly? You're saying to the Lord. Please stand. Let folk come. You come on. Say to the Lord somewhere on your knees. Lord, I love you. And I want to love you in a deeper way. And I want God to be honored with my life. Wonderful. Wonderful. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Would you pour out your heart to God right now? (laughs) 
Yes, he is. He's a Cast your care upon him at this moment. Jesus your troubles, your fears. Throw it on Jesus. God's moving in your life. Bring your family. Bring your children. Amen. Thank God he's all we need. Yeah. Hallelujah. If you need Christ, you ought to come right now. You've never been saved. You need to get saved today. It's urgent. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Yes. Amen. Yes. God's moved among us. He wants to do a work in us. Please be back tonight. Be back every night this week. Take it seriously. God wants to do something for you.